There's maybe a few words to my person. As mentioned, my name is Andreas Mehl, and I'm working in research in BioCrop Science Headquarter in Monheim in Germany. Since 1995, in the Institute for Disease Control, and I started in a lab for biochemistry and physiology of uh, fungicides and plants, working on mode of action studies and mode of resistance studies with new molecules we have in, uh, developed in our institute. And since 2001, I'm responsible for resistance monitoring and resistance management activities uh, for fungicides worldwide in all crops where we need to get information on fungicide sensitivity. And in this context, I'm also representing our company in the international working groups of the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. You may know this group, it's called FRAC, and has been founded 30 years ago, roughly. And uh, Bayer was a founder of this group as well. And so in this context, I would like to give a talk on the risk of fungicide resistance in Western Canada and to explain how do fungicides work in plants, also to follow here the title the science behind uh, of uh, plant protection. So I would like to start, of course, with a view on the agenda here. I would like to give a short introduction on resistant risk assessment and on the overall tasks of the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. Then I would like to give you some technical background insight into biochemical and biological mode of action of fungicides. This knowledge is important to, to react on possible resistance development. Therefore, I will come then to fungicide resistance mechanisms and give you some examples on our monitoring. And please don't be surprised, I will show some slides on the sensitivity monitoring data you will not found in your handout. The reason is this data may be somewhat sensitive and therefore I will not get publication approval for this uh, uh, monitoring data because these uh, data are also related to regulatory purposes in Europe. I hope for your understanding, but most of the slides are printed in the handout. And I then would like to conclude on resistance management strategies and give a final conclusion. So I would like to start here with this cake diagram on different modes of action of fungicides. We have more, now more or less 40 different chemical classes of four different modes of actions in the market. But you see here the majority of fungicides belong to the three groups here, more or less covering 70% of all the fungicides which are available. And you see here the first group here uh, is uh, representing the so-called multi-site or unspecific fungicides. Good example here is, for example, chlorothalonil, you know very well from Bravo maybe, also antracol and other quite old chemistry. The biggest piece here are the so-called sterol C14 demethylase inhibitors, or better known as DMI or azole fungicides. It's the biggest and most important group, and examples here are, of course, our Folicure and Prozaro, covering Prothioconazole and Tebeconazole, but also Caramba, Metconazole, also Tilt, Popiconazole, all these compounds with the azole in the name belong to this important class. And finally, the third group you may know under the name strobilurines or QI fungicides targeting the enzyme cytochrome C reductase. And here good examples are, for example, uh, 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 Acapella, picoxystrobine from DuPont, but also Headline, of course, Puraclostrobine from BSF, and also in our strategic trifloxystrobine is included. And therefore, these classes re uh, representing here also a big piece of the cake. A new class, which I would also like to cover in my talk, are the so-called succinate dehydrogenase inhibitors, SDHI fungicides. They are more and more introduced into the market worldwide. And examples here in Canada, you may know from BASF, the product Lance, with the active ingredient Boscolid, as well as Vertisan from DuPont with the product, uh, with the fungicide uh, Pentiopirate. If you like, you can see here more or less an overview on these chemistries on the FRAC webpage. Of course, it's not easy to, for you now to see all these different structures and molecules. Just should illustrate you the different mode of action classes. And the classification is more or less most related to the cross-resistance pattern class. That means all the individual compounds belonging here to one group are cross-resistance, which means 
if one representative of this group show sensitivity shifts or resistance, the other compounds of this group are affected as well and vice versa. And here in the red uh, areas, you see here the group of the QI fungicides, the strobilurines is a big one, and the biggest one as mentioned are here the azo or DMI fungicides. So what about FRAC? FRAC, the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, as mentioned, has been founded more or less 30 years ago. And the task, of course, for FRAC is to identify and manage fungicide resistance problems. FRAC is more or less a group of the plant production <coughs> chemistry uh, industry. And uh, so we meet annually to exchange knowledge on current sensitivity or resistance issues to show vice versa our data and to discuss and on agree on resistance management guidelines for important fungicide classes. This is of course always a compromise, but uh, I think it's a very important uh, uh, way to, to communicate on, on upcoming resistance problems. FROC is also industry counterpart of EPO and other big organizations. And in this role, we of course try to avoid overregulation by defining standards and risk classifications, particularly for pathogens, for fungicides, but also for the agronomic risk, which is often underestimated. A good example here in Europe, in France, this is the most demanding authority, I think, in the world. They ask every two years to get monitoring data for most important pathogens, mainly from cereals, but also from canola. And if you do not provide monitoring data, they assume that you're hiding some information and then you're in danger to lose your registration or registration. So if you do not do a monitoring, you're out of the game. And I hope that this uh, uh, way will not be in the future in Canada, but uh, uh, at least it uh, causes a lot of uh, uh, work and is also quite costly. Of course, you can see in the internet some monographs describing our work, fungicide pathogen risk assessment tables, uh, we describe how to measure a baseline. A baseline is a set of data describing the sensitivity of a population of a, a particular pathogen in a particular crop at the time prior to the launch of the product. This is necessary to later on to see if there is a sensitivity <coughs> shift happened or not. Uh, then you see also a frog mode, of code, uh, frog mode of action code list which describes more or less the risk for each fungicide class. So what about resistance management? Of course, it ensures and prolongs the life cycle of fungicides, but if you have more or less tried to, to if you try to, 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 to interpret what is resistance, you can of course have the scientific point of view. It's a genetic change in response uh, to the use of the fungicide. This causes more or less mutations. This is more or less an academic point of view. From a farmer's point of view, uh, mostly resistance is seen as a big threat, automatically leading to the impression that you have a strong loose loss of efficacy and that the product is not longer useful. You may have a big experience in herbicide resistance, and I would really like to tell you, fungicide resistance is completely different from herbicide resistance or from insecticide resistance. I will go later on a little bit in detail on the different resistance mechanisms, but here I would like to say that Fungicide resistance is mostly based on target site mutations, whereas herbicide or insecticide resistance is caused by metabolic processes. And the difference is metabolic resistance needs energy. And the fungus is not only fighting against the fungicide, but also against uh, the defense mechanisms from the side of the plant. And because the fungus is therefore treated from both sides. Such energy consuming resistance mechanisms are not uh, positive for the pathogen. That's why we have a completely different resistance scenario compared to the herbicide world. And this is also the reason why resistance in fungicides can be managed in a quite good way. So the overall task for us in resistance management is of course to monitor and analyze the sensitivity profiles of different pathogens, to inform everybody on possible risks as early as possible, not only inside our company to 
more or less think about new products, new mixtures, but also in front of the authorities to inform the farmers that certain product may not work as expected. We work on the scientific basis of resistance development and of course on management measures. We develop appropriate resistance management strategies and as mentioned, we have to fulfill the demands of the officials. And in this context, it's of course important for us to take also the leadership in this area. So, what about the fungicide resistance risk assessment? I also have a triangle, uh, but this is a resistance risk triangle. As mentioned before, we have the fungicide risk, we have the pathogen risk, and we have the agronomic risk. And the agronomic risk is more or less describing yeah, factors which you may not uh, can manipulate. So weather is, of course, something uh, uh, which is not possible for us to, 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 to modulate. On the other hand, looking at your conditions in Western Canada with a strong winter and the short growing period and the overall number of fungicide applications, I would like to say, that the agronomic risk in Canada is quite low. And I think this is a quite positive message for you. For comparison, in the UK and southern East England, in Kent, you have always mild winters, humid conditions, and farmers used to spray wheat four times. And uh, uh, it's clear if you have only one or two treatments, you have, of course, a much lower selection pressure compared to the situation in the UK or for example in Ireland and also in northern Germany. But let's first start with the <coughs> fungicide risk. I mentioned already different mode of action classes which are individually cross-resistant here and PUI strabilene fungicides are classified as high-risk fungicide. So uh, I will give examples on the development of strabilene fungicide resistance and mostly after two years after the market launch, we observed in the multitude of pathogens strong resistance problems. Benz imidazoles is also the old example. This is the reason why FRAC has been founded. And finally, phenylamides are also carrying a high risk. For example, metalaxyl, well known for the control of late blight. The new class here, the STHI fungicides, I give the examples, Vertizan, Lance, and so on also carrying a quite high risk, but it's a little bit lower compared to the QI fungicides, just the medium to high risk class. And the positive news is the most important fungicide class, the DMI fungicides, the triazoles, are only carrying a medium risk because the resistance characteristic is completely different to the characteristics of QI sub-NCBDazoles, and I will explain it later on. And then we have also low to medium risk classes, for example, the amines carrying a low risk, broadly used in Europe for the control of powder mildew and cereals, spiroxamine, tridomorph, and popimorph, these are the compounds. And as mentioned, multi-site inhibitors, the old groups such as Bravo, chlorothalonil, carry really a low risk. Nowadays, we are also working with biologic compounds. For example, you may know serenade, the mode of action is just a disruption of microbial membranes. It's a physical process, so this compound is not targeting an enzyme. And if you have not an enzyme as a target, you cannot get a mutation in the enzyme. So that means that the resistance is even lower because it's uh, not possible, more or less. This is an example how we come to this risk classification of pathogens, and here, Sample wheat, powder, mildew here, you have seven different mode of action classes uh, which has been developed for the control of wheat, powder, mildew. First of all here, quinoxifene, then the strobilurines, cyprinil in anilinopyrimidine, amines as mentioned, spiroxamine, tridomorph, and so on, and the DMIs, the big group, follicule, prosaro, caramba, tilt, and so on, and then some old groups, ethyrimol and benzimidazoles. The green color indicates here on the left hand side uh, uh, the, the, the year of the launch and then the red or orange colored period indicates the time where resistance has been reported and broadly spread into environment. And you see here, due to the different colors, 
uh, a change, a, a kind of a, ex explaining the, the difference in the resistance. These are disruptive resistance cases and causing big problems, whereas here with the shifting type, you have more or less uh, decreased sensitivity, but still activity of your compounds. However, overall, you see here mostly after two or three years after the market introduction, resistance has been detected. And uh, this is, of course, a big problem. This is, if you sum up more or less all the years here, you come to 120 use years. But finally, seven out of seven mode of actions develop resistance. This is 100%. And this is the reason why we classify reed powder mildew as a high-risk pathogen. Good example, and I think I learned that uh, you have mostly problems with rust and fusarium species. Brown rust here from, from wheat, Puccinia triticina, is clearly a low-risk pathogen. You see here, as indicated in the color, neither for QI fungicides, for amines, nor for DMI fungicides, also not for the new class of SCHI fungicides, which is in, in fact an old class, but you have a, a new new class of uh, broad spectrum SCHIs introduced in 2006. You have, see no red color indicating that there is definitely no report available describing resistance of brown rust. And I think this is a very good message for you that you have first a low ergonomic risk and also major low-risk pathogens. Fusarium species are also classified to carry a low resistance risk. The only pathogens who are carrying a moderate resistance risk are the leaf spot pathogens such as septoria or net blotch and scald. And this is summarized here in this list. Really here the highest pathogens, the most highest risk carrying the powder mildews of sea worlds here, wheat powder mildew, barley powder mildew, and also some pathogens of grapes here, grape downy mildew, grape powder mildew, botrytis is also a very highest pathogen. And here very important also for the banana growing areas, then mentioned it, uh, black sicatoka here. But this is no surprise if you know that in <coughs> Costa Rica and Central America, uh, bananas are treated up to 80 times, 80 a year, only towards the same compound. It's not a surprise that resistance is uh, given. However, the medium risk fungicides here, I mentioned it here, Septoria, Mepisfella gaminicola, Scald, Ice Spot, and also Late Blight is classified as medium risk pathogen. However, this three class system is hardly suited to deliver a complete information. Uh, it's more or less a certain gradient. But the good news is here, Puccinia, Ross species, and Fusarium species, and Smuts and Buns <coughs> are really regarded to carry a low risk, although we have to admit that even low risk pathogens, yeah, the risk is not there. Uh, always it's possible that something can happen, but from the experience uh, from at least the last three decades, we know that these are really low risk pathogens, and I think this is really good news for you as well. Okay, I mentioned already the ergonomic risk. <coughs> which is more or less driven by resistance cultivars. Uh, I remember here Andy's talk, of course, very important. Irrigation is also driving more or less resistant. If you have continuous irrigation and a high fertilization, you increase the resistance risk because the fungus is also happy to have everything he needs. Uh, and the climatic conditions, of course. So if you have here the score from zero to one, and the score from pathogen point of view is score one to three, and from the fungicide from 0 0.5 to three, more or less uh, uh, a uh, multiplication of these factors, you see that the most risky scenario is dramatically uh, is smaller compared to a country with a high ergonomic risk. The fungicide risk is, of course, uh, defined by the target of the fungicide, so if you have a single target, it's much easier to get resistance if a single gene controls resistance and if you have a high and persistent activity. You may imagine that, of course, in our institute and in our company, we are continuously looking for new compounds and new mode of actions. And, of course, particularly from the marketing, the demands are always we need a product with a broad spectrum of activity, which is cheap in the production, 
uh, uh, and which has a perfect persistency and uh, uh, most important, which have to be applied in low rates. On the other hand, you may imagine if you have a fungicide where you may need only 20, 30 or 40 grams per hectare, this mode of action must be so active that the resistance risk is particularly very high and always I get a little bit problems in my, my gut feeling when I hear about a new mode of action with such a strong intrinsic activity. A pathogen is uh, defined to have a high risk if it has a short life cycle, if I have a high spore production, if the spores are more or less widespread dispersed, and if the pathogen infects all growth stages, and of course if the pathogen has sex. That's the reason why soil pathogens are mostly regarded to have a low risk. Mostly you see no spores, rhizoctonia is a good example. Uh, sexual stages are sometimes not known. And of course, uh, it's a problem for a soil pathogen to spread around a region or a country uh, if there is a resistance given. <coughs> 